Oh, England's own. You're right, ho! Hey Vinyl Community, it's Chris on the Vinyl Transmission Channel. So I'm here to have so much fun with you. We're going to look at the 23 albums that Uriah Heep put out between uh, 1970 and 2014. And with each album, we're going to meet people in the Uriah Heep family. So it's going to be kind of like going to a family reunion where you kind of meet the cousins and everybody first and then you get into the heart of it and then you meet you know grandpa byron and uncle mick and all of that so it's a pretty cool layout and i've really given a lot of thought to how they've been ranked uh just enough to uh you know hopefully make the discography make a little bit of sense but i have a physical copy of each and every album and you're going to be amazed at the connections that they have to Every band in, in great classic rock, heavy rock history, especially in the 70s. So we're going to look at band members, people who contribute in maybe songwriting or the album covers, and it's, it's going to be awesome. So uh, hang out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Number 23, the worst album in Uriah Heep's catalog. That would be Equator, and this is from 1985. This is the Peter Golby era, and this is the third album with Peter Golby. Now, Peter Golby is a great singer, and he's the one person who's really blameless in this record, kind of being such a bummer. Um, this is the one album in Uriah Heep's whole catalog where the whole album is credited the writing to just Uriah Heep. It's almost as if they're just all kind of uh, pointing the finger at each other. So Peter Golby came from Trapeze. And that in that band, he was in with a guy named Mel Galley, who went on to join Whitesnake for their Slide It In era. So that's sort of the fun fact for uh, this album, is that Peter Golby was originally in Trapeze with Mel Galley, later of Whitesnake. Uh, there is one song that I love on this album, and it is called Holding On. And it's a great driving ballad. It shows off Peter Golby's voice. And um, the problem with this album is that it's sort of, it, it almost, if you can see some of the song titles, it's like they are, it's so cheesy and silly and adolescent. It's like they're like making the music for a banana split party. Rockarama, School's Burning, Poor Little Rich Girl. It's just pretty cheesy. Now, this song called Holding On is a great driving ballad, and it's to me, it's the best song on the record. And there's some other good moments, but it's just kind of spacey. There's keyboards that are just kind of wandering off everywhere. Peter Golby's the one thing that makes it worthwhile. The chorus to Holding On is, what's the point of holding on when the spirit is gone? And it kind of fits with the band here because this uh, lineup broke down and um, they, you know, you're right, he emerged later with a different singer. So number 23, Equator from 1985. Number 22 is also in the Peter Golby era. And that is Uriah Heep Head First. Now, the band sounds fantastic on this, but the songs aren't that much better than they are on Equator. This is from 1983, so it's a couple years before. Now, with this album, Bob Daisley recorded it, and then he left the band, and then Trevor Boulder joined the band on tour. So Bob Daisley, of course, from Rainbow and Blizzard of Oz. Uh, he has even worked with Black Sabbath and Gary Moore. Uh, but this is a, a very cool AOR um, album. It's got a real heavy rock, a great mix of you know synthesizer, not the Uriah Heep and you know, Deep Purple classic organ sound, but um, 
instead, you know, a more more pop sound, but very polished, very high energy, and um, a record that I like. This is number 22, Head First, from 1983, the uh, Peter Golby era. Check out The Other Side of Midnight is a great tune. Number 21, that is Outsider. Now, this is their most recent album. This is with Bernie Shaw. And so, this is the Bernie Shaw era. With this album, a guy named Davey Rimmer came in to play bass uh, after Trevor Boulder's passing. So, Davey Rimmer came from Zodiac Mind War. Uh, this album sounds really good, but the songs, they almost sound like radio-edited versions of Uriah Heep songs. They don't, they don't go on in the right places, There's, and they're just kept to these real quick earworm type of things. And the album kind of ends on a bummer note with the, with the uh, last song. Um, so, I mean, I can vacillate and enjoy this a little bit, but for the most part, it's just kind of... Um, it's a disappointment on the uh, three albums, or rather the two albums that came immediately before this, which kind of are in a single run. So number 21, Outsider from 2014, Bernie Shaw era. And number 20 is Different World. This is from 1991 and uh, is also the Bernie Shaw era. So let's talk about him. Bernie is a Canadian singer. He came from a band called Stratus, uh, in which uh, Clive Burr from Iron Maiden was in the band after he left Maiden. So that's what he was doing right before he joined Heap. And he's got a, a more, you know, a softer, more melodic sound, a more top forty foreigner type of sound of his voice. Um, but he's done some great work. This is kind of a. a, a an album that I really like. I think this one was produced by Trevor Boulder, and um, is just really great. There is a breast there on that on in the corner of the screen if you're not going going blind yet. And um, but it's the the songs are it's very stuck in the '80s and very synthesizer heavy. But it is a uh, really long. This is the longest running um, lineup of the group of the Bernie Shaw era. So this band just stuck around for a long time. And this is kind of one of their, if not their very first album together, is, is one of their earlier efforts and things are really starting to congeal here. So this is a uh, number 20, Different World from 1991, the Bernie Shaw era. Number 19, Raging Silence. This is from 1989. And uh, Phil Lanzon is in the band at this point. He's kind of replaced uh, Ken Hensley on the keyboards and doing a lot of the songwriting. And this album is pretty cool. It has a cover of Argent, Blood Red Roses. And it has, um, or rather, Hold Your Head Up. It has an original song called Blood Red Roses, which is pretty great. And, uh, you know, this is, again, kind of anachronistic to the time period where it sort of just has an 80s cheese flavor that's out of step with, you know, their, really their contemporaries of Sabbath and maybe some other people. It's just a real far cry from that. But I really enjoy this record. It's, it's put together. It's, um, again, that Bernie Shaw lineup with uh, a real consistent membership. And we'll get to the other members as we, uh, as we go along. So Phil Lanzon from Grand Prix, um, and who was in that band? Oh, so, and he was in that band with Bernie Shaw, and uh, Phil Lanzon was also in a later version of Sweet before he joined Uriah Heep. But he's a great, he's a good songwriter, he's written some uh, cool stuff, and uh, yeah, Raging Silence, 1989, number 19 in Uriah Heep's Disguise. Number 18, Sea of Light from 1995. This is sort of a progressive pop side of the group. Uh, kind of much more everything's mid-pace. They're really not going for the heavy classic rock sound. But I quite like this record. This cover, as you can probably guess, is done by Roger Dean. Who also collaborated a lot with Yes, obviously. Um, but his, his imagery really suited Uriah Heep very well. So I just want to show this one for this record. Uh, this is a book uh, on Roger Dean that has everything from him. He has space escape modules that he's designed to architecture, to band logos. 
and uh, that back cover is actually the uh, heap cover. So kind of cool. So Roger Dean there, yeah. Th this is a great. Uh, this is a great album. Like I said, it's not gonna. Um, it's not very caffeinated, but it's 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 pretty cool. And their songwriting would only get better on on other efforts where they kind of go for this more progressive, long form uh, version of Heap. So Sea of Light, 1995, the uh, Bernie Shaw era. Okay, number 17 is Wonder World. So this is our first vinyl, and we're going to see a lot more vinyl as we go forward, but you know, obviously the ones that are sort of lower priority, those are the ones that are on CD. So um, this is a, a really cool album. The reason it's kind of so high on the list is that after the title song, Wonder World, which is uh, just perfect, um, the songwriting definitely does fade off on this. But this is a great uh, lineup, and the song Wonder World is a staple for them. This is a Gary Thane's last album. This is Gary Thane right here. And so he was the bass player in the band. Uh, not the original bass player, but he was stuck it out for a long time. It said that he's the best, uh, you know, Lee Kerslake said that Gary Thane's the best musician that was ever in Uriah Heep. And Gary Thane played with a band called Keith Hartley. And he played at Woodstock with Keith Hartley. So Gary Thane right here uh, played at Woodstock and then became a you know real staple of this is the classic lineup that you're looking at here. I won't name everybody now because we'll we'll get to them later. So Uriah Heep, Wonder World, 1974. The uh, lowest ranking album to have uh, David Byron singing. Number 16, Into the Wild from 2011. This is the Bernie Shaw era. And this is just a really good album. There's a couple songs on here that are kind of that earworm problem that we were looking at on um, Outsider. But other than that, this album is a 10. It's such a great uh, statement of the heap sound. The, the songwriting is pretty killer. This is Trevor Boulder's last album with the band. And uh, let's see, on this one, we want to actually talk about the artist here who did the cover. The artist, is his name is Io Annis, and he's done several things later for Heap, including some of their live stuff and kind of recreating some of the Roger Dean images. But let me show you a, an album that Io Annis is also on the credit for for some of the design work not all the artwork artwork but he's also listed and that's on this album so just so just kind of a funny connection saying like i said he's given some credit for the uh graphics on it and he has one of the things i like about this is it's sort of pixelated intentionally and there's a little bit of that sort of intentionally computerized feel on on his work here too so this is a great record. I definitely recommend it. Just a great Uriah Heep later album, 2011, Into the Wild, uh, Bernie Shaw era. Uh, number 15, Sonic Origami. This is uh, from 1998, and it's the Bernie Shaw era. This is Lee Kerslake's last album with the band. And he had such an amazing run with... Uh, with Uriah Heep. So his main other credit outside of Heep is uh, being a part of the original Blizzard of Oz band. But just a player with a ton of uh, personality and um, yeah just some amazing work through the years. You know if you see him, uh, if you ever see live footage of him or in some of the DVDs and just just an amazing uh, player. This is um, kind of a more acoustic version of that, um, the, uh, what was the earlier record we were looking at, um, Sea of Light, kind of a more acoustic version of that, not so uh, sort of yes sounding. This is much more acoustic, and Bernie Shaw just sounds fantastic on the songs that uh, they tackle on this, Sonic Origami. From 1998, Bernie Shaw era, number 15. Number 14 from 2008, this is Wake the Sleeper. 
And this uh, had the joining of Russell Gilbrook, who replaced Lee Kerslake. And Russell was is a uh, you know professional drum clinic uh, guy, but he's he's backed like or worked with Van Morrison, Tony Iommi. So he's he's a world class, and I mean his the energy he brings is killer. I have seen him live. This album is incredible because uh, every everyone contributes to the writing. The songs are so interesting. This was after a 10-year gap uh, that they came out with this in 2008. And it just came on like a ton of bricks. You know, the first album without Lee Kerslake and just they they laid assured all doubts. And unfortunately, this is their le most recent best album. You know, I really would love to see them get in this trajectory again. Number 13, Conquest from 1980. So 28 years earlier, they made this album with uh, John Sloman, who uh, is a really cool singer. And this is probably the best thing that he ever did and the thing that he's most known for. He did go on to work with Gary Moore. And uh, one neat thing I found out was that after uh, Sloman made this album, he's got a real lyrical voice, real... Um, unusual voice for a rock singer really ornate and really just uh you know a lot of embellishments and stuff but um very cool and uh he so he went worked with uh gary moore and uh what was that what else was i saying about him um oh his uh his solo album that he made was produced by todd rundgren who i'm a big fan of but the solo album just completely flopped, and uh, that was really uh, a really hard thing on his career. The drummer on this album is Chris Slade, who is uh, now the drummer in ACDC working with Axl Rose. So there is the uh, ACDC, Axl, Guns N' Roses, Uriah Heap connection. Uh, Uriah Heap, Conquest, 1980. Really good record, I think. Number 13 on the list. Number 12, Innocent Victim from 1977. This is the uh, John Lawton era of the band. And this, he's done, did three albums with them. This is his, the lowest ranking album on the list. And he's from a band called Lucifer's Friend. And let me see, did I pull that out? No, I, I meant to. But uh, Lucifer's Friend from 1970. And uh, some of their other work as well. Phenomenal stuff. What a great singer. Uh, this album has some amazing songs. Free and Easy is a prototype of thrash. It's got another song on here, Free Me, which is just should have been a big hit on classic rock FM radio. I mean, it's a killer song. Um, but it kind of drifts off a little bit after that. Ken Hensley did a couple songs here with an outside songwriter, which was kind of unusual, and they very unusual, and they have kind of a different flavor. This CD has some bonus tracks, which are really great, which are outtakes that uh, never made it to um, the album. But, but some of them are better than what ended up on the album. So Uriah Heep, this is Innocent Victim. From 1977, the John Lawton era, number 12. Number 11, Return to Fantasy, 1975, uh, with uh, David Byron on vocals. Now, on this album, John Wetton is in the band from Asia, from King Crimson, from uh, UK, and uh, just amazing. He has uh, doesn't sing on this. But this has some great classic songs from Heap. Um, Return to Fantasy, Shady Lady, uh, Why Did You Go is a great ballad. But it just has a real flavor to it. I mean, it's just drenched in, the, in like a gothic, uh, over-the-top, heavy, progressive rock. And uh, Return to Fantasy, Uriah Heap, 1975, number 11 on the list. This is uh, number 10. Abominog. This is from 1982, and this is the Peter Golby era of the band. 
uh, he started off our list with uh, the first two albums on this list. But this one is number 10. It's an absolutely killer record. It's got a great AOR, heavy rock feel. All the songs are great. About half the songs are written by the band. Half the songs are outside writers. Uh, during this one, we're going to talk about the guy right here in the middle, John Sinclair. John Sinclair played on the Spinal Tap soundtrack. So you could say he's an auxiliary member of Spinal Tap. But, you know, people talk about who inspired the band and Uriah Heep and different bands are mentioned. Well, Uriah Heep plays on the Spinal Tap album. Uh, John Sinclair, who went on to join Ozzy Osbourne's band. This was uh, the first concert I ever saw was this tour. And I have such a vivid memory of John Sinclair, like rolling his eyes back, pushing his keyboards forward, and uh, it, was, it was kind of insane. But really like this record. It's not nearly as heavy as the album cover makes it uh, look, um, but it sure is eye-catching. Abominog, number 10. From 1982, the Peter Golby era. Number nine is High and Mighty from 1976. And this is the David Byron era of the band. John Wetton is also in the band. And this record is just a, a perfect 10. This is such a great record. Uh, the songs are just fantastic. There's some great aggression where John Wetton sings on the opening track. You have Misty Eyes, which is just a gorgeous uh, song that could have been, could have been, should have been a hit. They take on their critics in a couple songs, Can't Keep a Good Band Down, Can't Stop Singing, and they just really kind of lay out their uh, Uriah Heap philosophy. They're just going to keep on going no matter what. And this is uh, David Byron's last album with the band, and uh, that's so sad. Uh the one little fun fact we'll put in here is that, you know, David Byron um, is King Diamond's favorite singer. So, you know, uh, David Byron died, uh, you know, a few years after leaving the band. Even he was invited back into the band and refused. And it was just a, just a tragedy because he was such a, such a great singer. This is his last album with the band. It's got a really kind of crazy, not, not very great cover but uh, it's an awesome record. High and Mighty, 1976, number nine on the list. Number eight on the list is Firefly. This is from 1977 and is the John Lawton era of the band. Uh, this is just an amazing record. This is uh, pretty much written entirely by Ken Hensley and just has the most, you know, Perfect from beginning to end. It's like a short story, a long poem, just perfectly conceived, beautifully recorded. Um, one of their, you know, might be their classiest album. And just, you know, there's no false moves. Nothing ever gets too heavy, but it's just, you know, beautifully done and very dynamic. Got a fantastic cover. Uh, and John Lawton's an amazing singer. So let's talk about this. Um, this label, the Bronze label, uh, which is named after Jerry Braun, who was a uh, producer, manager uh, for Uriah Heep and started Bronze Record, Bronze, Braun, Bronze. And uh, they were also instrumental in uh, putting out a lot of Motorhead records. Okay, number seven, Fallen Angel, 1978. John Lawton era. So this is the best album with John Lawton on it. And, um, you know, this is even harder rocking than Firefly. And everyone contributes, which is the reason I kind of give this a higher rating. It's just, and it's just got that energy throughout it. It's got this real flair for different kinds of songs. And uh, some of the things on here are just incredible. Um... Love or Nothing, Fallen Angel is a great song. Um, yeah, Come Back to Me is a fantastic ballad. Uriah Heep, Fallen Angel, John Lawton era, 1978. Okay, the fun fact here is about Trevor Boulder, who uh, is on this album. He was in the Spiders from Mars and uh, also in later Wishbone Ash but really instrumental in uh, some of the David Bowie albums, including Hunky Dory. 
and was in the band with um, you know Spiders from Mars without Bowie. So even after uh, um, the association with Bowie carried on with that, and he was a great contributor to Heap. So 1978, Fallen Angel, John Lawton era, number seven on the list. Number six on the list is Salisbury from 1971. So we're looking at here the, um, I guess, a UK pressing for it or German pressing. And uh, there is a one song variation. And then this is the American version, which has this pretty awful cover. Uh, so, an amazing album, though. Ken Hensley sings the song on here, Lady in Black, which is kind of uh, neat. It's not David Byron singing, it's actually Ken Hensley singing it. And that song just put them on the map, it keeps them on the map. But a great heavy rock record, um, not as good as the debut, which is higher up on the list, um, but... a just a fantastic classic heavy rock record blues influence uh, Uriah Heep Salisbury from 1971 so Ken Hensley uh, he's who we're going to talk about with this record he um, was in a band called The Gods with uh, Mick Taylor who later went on to be in the Rolling Stones in this area era. So he's on the Exile on Main Street album. This is a fantastic record. So there is the uh, Rolling Stones, The Gods, Ken Hensley, Uriah Heep connection you were wondering about. And number five on the list is very heavy, very humble. And in the United States, it was just called Uriah Heep. And again, they uh, there's a one song difference. What they should have done was dropped uh, Come Away Melinda from this record and kept it all heavy rockers, uh, but they didn't do that. Otherwise, this album would really stand so next to uh, the Black Sabbath debut with being perfect. Come Away Melinda isn't written by the band. It's sort of just stuck in there, and it may have tainted their reputation in some circles ever since, but um, I a monster of a 1970 classic heavy metal hard rock album. Uh, so Mick Box plays on this album, and he plays on every other album. So everyone we've talked about previous to here, you know, has played with Mick Box in this band. And he's just an amazing, uh, got an amazing energy, he's still with the band. You see pictures of him today, it's, he's indistinguishable from how he looks uh, in these earlier pictures. So, number five, very heavy, very humble, 1970, David Byron era. Number four, an incredible album, Sweet Freedom. This song, this album has stealing on it, has these incredible pictures, and that's what we're going to talk about on this album, because the guy who took these pictures, his name is Finn Costello. And he did some iconic album covers uh, after doing this for Uriah Heep. Uh, 1973, David Byron era, they're just on fire here. I mean, they, they are as commanding as these figures in the sky. They just could absolutely execute anything. And uh, such, such a great album. It's heavy in places. Stealing is such a pleasing, easy-to-listen-to classic rock hit. And everything else in between. It's just got amazing writing from Uriah Heep. So, 1973, Sweet Freedom, David Byron era, uh, number four. So, I'm going to show you a couple albums that Finn Costello also did the uh, album cover to. So, I'm just going to show you um, two and that is, this is a Finn Costello. And this is also a Finn Costello. And just before I move on, I forgot one thing and is back on to Abominog. The artist who made this album cover, his name is Les Edwards. And he also did this album cover. And then this one 
which you probably know best of all. So I wanted to show those all by the same artist. So Uriah Heep, the Rod's Metallica connection you were wondering about. Number three from 1972, The Magician's Birthday. Uh, an amazing album. Just some of their best songwriting, just mythological, poetical, soft, classic rock. Um, just absolutely great. Um, there's a guest player on this album who plays pedal steel on Tails. And his name is Brian John B.J. Cole. He also plays on the Return to Fantasy album. And there's beautiful bits of playing. Uh, so he's just kind of a great guest feature, guest player to talk about. I kind of looked him up and I was amazed to see that he, I had seen him live and not realized it. In fact, he played at what I consider to be the favorite concert I've ever seen, which was uh, John Cale and the Red House Painters. And he was one of the multitude of guitar players that John Cale had. So I was blown away to realize that I did see the same guy who plays on this album, see him play live with John Cale and was blown away. So Uriah Heep, Magician's Birthday, 1972, David Byron era, number three on the list. So number two on the list, Demons and Wizards, 1972, David Byron era. This has their biggest hits on it. It's uh, absolutely an amazing record. The Wizard, Traveler in Time. So on this one, let's. I have two different things to tell you about as a fun fact for this record. One is that the uh, the the song The Wizard is has a co-writer with Ken Hensley, and his name is Mark Clark, and he was a bass player who was in the band for about five minutes. But in that five minutes. He uh, co-wrote that song with, with Ken Hensley. I guess they say he wrote the middle eight uh, for it. But Mark Clark went on to appear on this album. He is the bass player on this entire record. So there's the Billy Squire, The Wizard, Uriah Heep connection that uh, you were wondering about. But just a fantastic album. Just one you, 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 should, you should never be without. Uriah Heep, Demons and Wizards, 1972, David Byron era. So before I get to the last one, one the second thing I wanted to tell you about Demons and Wizards and make another connection is that Uriah Heep did do uh, one of those concerts where they play the whole album and they re and then they released it as a as a recording on its own right. And when they did that, they had Mickey Moody from White Snake, that's our second White Cakes, White Snake connection, but I believe that's Mickey Moody there with the double SG, and he plays, um, he plays on. It's called Live in Kawasaki is the album, but they do the entire Demons and Wizards album, and it's cool that they brought in a second guitar player just to kind of flush it out a little bit more. But this is a killer record, Mickey Moody, uh, White Snake part of the uh, Uriah Heep. Okay, so let me show you just the back cover of this first. Um, some of the players that I haven't mentioned um, are on the first three albums, the original bass players and drummers. So even everyone we talked about, um, there's even more that I just couldn't get to in this video. But uh, July Morning uh, is one of the biggest songs on here. It's a staple of them. And uh, Manfred Mann... Uh, plays Moog on that track. And of course, he's best known for popularizing the Quinn the Eskimo by Dylan. So there's the Bob Dylan, Manfred Mann, Blinded by the Light, Bruce Springsteen, Uriah Heep connection that you were wondering about. But this album is just absolutely epic. It's triumphant. It's heavy. It's um, it's lyrical. It's just uh, their perfect record, the number one record to me. 1971, David Byron. This is my very special copy, unlike nobody's. Look at yourself. It's an amazing record. I highly recommend you check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Peace, love, and Uriah Heep. Uh, on the way out, you'll see all the albums listed in order. Uh, please leave a comment, and uh, thank you so much for hanging out. Take care.